Okay, once your bear is down, or your other big game animal, that's actually where the real work begins, although it's probably less work than you're thinking. If you haven't done this before, just try it. You can't really make bad cuts of meat, right? At the end of the day, meat is meat. And the only way you're gonna learn is by working at this. Um, it's great if you can call in somebody who knows what they're doing to learn from them, um, but you can also get good books or watch videos like this and learn what you're doing. If you're hunting big game, a gambrel is a very good investment. Uh, it's gonna help you to hoist that animal up off the ground so that you can work all around it. Um, if you don't have a gambrel, you can also do this with the animal on the ground and work on one side and roll it and then work on the other side. But today we're gonna hoist this bear and I've also got a pulley, which makes a world of difference as well to lift this animal up off the ground. Okay, we're gonna lift this bear by the back legs. Um, where you want to hook it is behind the Achilles tendon. So when you feel at the front of the paw, you can feel the ankle, you can feel the round shape of the bone, and then you can feel that Achilles tendon running up and down the back of the leg. And you want to make an incision between the bone and the Achilles tendon and that will hold the weight of the bear. So I'm going to start on the back side and find that spot. And I'm just pushing my knife through. And then I'm going to hook the gambrel on there and do the same on the other side. I'm uh, intending to have this hide tanned, so we're going to try and do a good job taking the hide off. Finding that little space behind the bone and pushing right through. It's actually, uh, it's tricky to um, twist the gambrel around sometimes so it's good if you've got these removable hooks so you can hook the bear and then line it all up and screw it back in. Find the hole that you made. Get that gambrel hook through there. Now I can set it up. Got a washer and the screw, I think these are like custom made stainless steel ones from Steel Rod. Uh, but obviously you can go to go to a, your favorite sporting goods store or sometimes your favorite Princess Auto and they carry this kind of stuff as well. Okay, we're going to brush. 100 bucks says we get sand in the meat. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's why we're going to brush it to try and uh, try and get as much of the sand off as possible before we start taking the hide off. This didn't go as cleanly as we wanted it to, and uh, we cheated. We used the car. Okay, so the trick for this, if you want to keep the hide, you want to do the best job that you can. Um, if you're not worried about the hide, you can go a little bit faster, but either way, if you do a good job, you'll maximize the amount of fat left on the carcass, which um, I always go out of my way to uh, save and render that fat. I've got a video about that on my channel if you're interested to also do that. And uh, you probably know that you can use it for cooking and also people really like to use it in pastries. So basically, um, I'm going to go up the insides of the legs to the ankles um, and then around the back and down. In Ontario, if you want to sell a bear hide, you have to leave all the claws on and the feet, um, which can be pretty tricky to manage. I think I'm going to take the time to do that this time, even though it's my intent to keep this hide. Uh, so to do that, we take all the hide off and then you cut the ankles off and you work on the feet later when you've got time. I think it's always worth too as you work uh, picking off any loose hairs, right? You gotta do it at some point anyway, so you might as well do it when you see them. And 
keep this carcass as clean as you can. It's also handy to have like a, a belt rag or something to wipe your hands on frequently instead of using your pants and your shirt like I do. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, just speaking of do as I say and not as I do, I packed a whole box of uh, nitrile gloves and then I forgot to put them on. And now it feels like it's too late. <laughs> Okay, you can see that there is a lot of fat on this bear. So we're gonna try and slab some fat off the back and then we're gonna break it down into primal quarters. The hide is off and looking very nice. And I left the skull on, but I'm gonna skin it out after when I have time. And we're just cleaning up our work surface. Some things that are handy to have, aside from your nitrile gloves are uh, work aprons, butcher paper, a sharpie marker for labeling, and freezer paper uh, tape or elastic bands. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take off a uh, front shoulder. The front shoulders are not attached with a joint. So what you're doing is you're going in to the armpit um, between the neck and the arm and you're just going to cut all the way around uh, and you shouldn't really run into you any resistance now you can do this with a longer knife but we've butchered bears and deer pretty frequently with just these short groman hunting knives and i'm going to cut through you want to hold it yep yeah. oh, so I can feel the shoulder blade and I'm coming up here to the ribs and the shoulder blade comes right up to this to the spine just about um, again if you're a beginner don't worry about making sloppy cuts because all that extra chunky business is going to go into your sausage grinding pile you want to throw it? yeah and then we'll Put it on the table. <laughs> there it is. Okay, again, just uh, working in the messy shed here. It's not really a problem though. So again, anytime you see a hair, just pick that off, put it on your apron or whatever you need to do to get rid of it. So the front shoulder is made up of the uh, arm, the shoulder, and the shoulder blade. What I like to do is take this arm off and I will just braise this as an arm roast. So um, if you don't want to mess around with joints, you can just get your meat saw and cut it through at this little elbow. If you want to be particular and you like messing around with this kind of thing, you can learn about how these joints are connected and then you can cut them right through um, at the joint. So there isn't really a huge advantage to this. It just means there's not going to be any bone chips in your meat and you'll feel like an anatomy superstar. I'm in between this joint now. I'm just cutting through where it's connected. You don't have to know all the parts of these bones in order to cut them. I certainly don't remember them. Kind of piece together how they're attached and cut all the connecting tissue. And we're through. So this is a this is your arm roast. So this is best for brazing and uh, your other alternative is to just chop it all up and put it in your grinding pile. 
I tend to do a lot of roasts with bear, so I'm going to leave it as an arm roast. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting. There's a lot of fat on the outside. If you want, you can trim it and add it to your fat pile to render. If you don't want to render the fat and you don't like eating the fat, you're gonna have to take some time here and trim the fat off of the bear. If you leave it on and you roast this, you're gonna end up with a very fatty roast. Um, if you're using some kind of a drippings pan, then that might not matter so much. You'll just be able to collect it underneath the meat and the meat will be fine. So this can be a slower process. You want a nice uh, sharp knife for this. You can use a sharp fillet knife um, or something shorter that's sharp. And this roast on a smaller bear, you could just have one large roast. Um, what I like to do is find, this is the shoulder and the shoulder blade. So I like to find where the shoulder comes into the blade and then I'll do a cut and find the joint. So I'm cutting at the end of the muscles and you can feel where that joint is. I'm gonna cut through, All right? You're gonna do a nice clean job or you're gonna do a hack job. Again, it doesn't really matter unless you're really trying to impress somebody. And once I find that joint, you can cut through with the saw, or if you want to learn about anatomy and feel like an anatomy superstar, you can disconnect that joint. Um, so, on the inside here, you may or may not be able to see where the joint is on this piece. Well, I'm going to cut around there, move your joint so you see whether you're cutting on the right side of it or not. I was just cutting on the wrong side of it, so all I was doing was dulling my knife. Okay, this is your, your classic kind of joint that you probably picture, a ball and socket. So we're going to cut. The more carefully you do this, the sharper your knife will stay. Cut until the joint is free and just finish cutting through. That's all there is to it for the front shoulders. So what I am going to do is pick off all the hair. I'm going to trim off this fat. I'm going to wrap this and call it a shoulder roast. I'm going to wrap this and call it a blade roast. Um, there are some odd bits of meat kind of trailing off the edge. So I might tidy up my edges, square it off a bit. I mean, this is all up to you how much work you want to put into it. Um, and that's my shoulder blade roast. Also, a lot of people won't cook this as a blade roast. They'll just uh, take all the meat off, put it in their grind pile, turn that into sausage or bear burgers. Here's the other front shoulder. I'm just going to do it with the saw this time. So what you want to do is cut through the meat with your knife, and then you want to cut through the bone with your saw. Sometimes if you hang it just off the edge of the table, let gravity open the joint or the bone for you. Try not to cut all the edge of your table up. Okay. So there it is, it's cut through. So I'm just gonna pick off this bone fragment, throw that out. And now we have another bare arm roast. Chris is doing a good wrap over here. That's the bare shoulder roast. If we do them in order, your next one is blade roast and then another arm. So again, there's lots of meat skirts hanging off the edge of this primal cut and this is all great 
fat and grinding meat. So I'm going to square off my edge here later and in another video I'll trim all this meat and this fat and I will render bare fat. Okay, I'm going to take off this meat skirt over here. And you can see there's a nice fat cap on this bear. And our fat pile is already getting pretty big. So let's trim off this fat layer. Sometimes you can peel it off if you find the layer. You might be able to peel the fat away from the meat. Just make a couple of cuts where you need to. I would say um, most of the work is in skinning the bear. If you want to do uh, a hide project after or send it in to get tanned, um, in Ontario, you can send it to the Canadian Tannery, just tagged with your hunting license, and um, they'll mail you back a uh, tanned bear, basically. Okay, so I want to find the joint. I'm going to cut through the flesh. My joints right here, so we're gonna saw these ones. And the um, saw is really poor at cutting through flesh and cartilage, and it's really good at cutting through bone. If you are having hard time getting a grip on it, use shop towel and as long as your shop towel is dry before it gets too greasy, that'll really help you to keep a grip. Actually, um, for most of the joints, now that I've had practice, I do prefer to do them up with the knife. Um, but the saw makes a nice clean cut, which is what a lot of people are, are looking for on the edge of their roast. So here's a little floppy meat skirt again. I'm just going to square that off, put it in my grinding fat pile. Chris is going to wrap that up as a bare blade and wrap up this one as a bare shoulder. Back to our hanging carcass. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm actually gonna cut through the spine right behind the rear quarters and take away all of the torso and neck of the bear. To lighten this up a bit, I'm going to trim off the um, belly meat here and that's gonna go into my grinding pile. And there's also a lot of abdominal fat here around the belly so that I'm going to take that off and here up around the groin it's over an inch thick here so let's get all this nice fat and add that to our fat pile <coughs> now I'm picking off any dirt and hairs as I go because I don't want that in my final product. So the ribs are here. We're going to cut them away. Um, this is the exit hole. We're going to remove that. We're not going to eat any meat around the exit hole. All right, let's cut. So from the pelvis, just cutting away this slab 
of meat up towards the hip and then down to the ribs and then I'm going to remove it along the edge of the ribs. Again, that's going to go into my grinding pile. <clears throat> I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Cutting around this thick groin fat down towards the hip, the edge of the um, spine there, and then along the ribs. Okay, into the grind pile. Oh, I forgot I, I was supposed to slab this fat off first. I'll end up doing it later. Okay, now um, there's lots of abdominal fat, big uh, chunky cheese curds of it in here. That's that's some pretty prized fat there. So we're going to remove that to keep it. And again, um, we did a very clean job removing um, guts. But I am looking for any contaminated meat or dirt in here. And now I've exposed the tenderloins that run along the inside of the spine. So tenderloins are um, they're, they're tender and they're also uh, a little bit fragile. So what you want to do is you can try and work your finger or your thumb in behind them or you can sort of cut along the spine to free them up from their attachment points and they're going to come right back up here to the uh, pelvic cavity let's call this just cutting as far behind them as I can reach with my knife freeing them up at the bottom and you're basically filleting this beautiful cut of meat off the inside of the spine and that is all there is to doing a basic tenderloin removal. That's nice and bloody, eh, for YouTube? <laughs> Might have to put this in the members only section. Um, You're a professional butcher, so you can do it. Yeah? Is yeah. that how it works? works? You should also note that um, you don't find these uh, parasites in the meat, but in the inside of the cavity, there are filarial worms. Okay, they look like little white uh, rice noodles. They can be up to eight inches long. Uh, almost every bear has them. Just be prepared that you're going to see them. There's an ick factor there, uh, and they can't hurt you. Just uh, as you find them, you just throw them away. You should, and pretend you, should, you never saw them. You should clarify that those ones won't harm you, but the ones in the intestines and muscle will. Yeah, so, I mean, almost all bears also have trichinosis, which is um, uh, a problematic disease and is destroyed by thorough cooking. So you should always cook your bear well done and uh, use a meat thermometer to make sure that you're hitting proper internal temperature. You should not make bear jerky or bear pepperettes unless they have reached that critical temperature to kill trichinosis cysts. That's in the muscle. And those are in the muscle, yeah. Now, again, I just kind of filleted along this, along the spine. I'm working on my weak side now here, so this isn't going as well, but I want to get in and cut it as close to the ribs as you can. You should be bumping up the ribs along them with your knife blade along every rib. I'm going to free this up at the bottom and continue to fillet it off the ribs and spine up towards the top, keeping it as intact as I can because that's going to make the prettiest piece of tenderloin meat. And there's the second one. <clears throat> now we have um, back fat and there are the uh, tenderloins along the back which we're probably going to cut into steaks. You can also cut them into roasts. Um, 
with your saw you can also cut the spine into uh, roasts with those box drops as well uh, but before we cut off the rib cage we're going to slab off some of this fat because I think it's going to be easier while the bear is hanging than while it is on a table. Again, you can, um, if you miss some, you can always trim it off after when you're doing your more careful cutting. What I'm doing here is I'm just trying to get off all this fat of which there is a lot on this bear uh, without cutting too much into the meat. So look at all this flank fat that's here basically and then up onto the uh, rump and the spine. Just cutting, cutting, cutting. You got a grip on this? Oh yeah, there you go. Okay, it's a lot. Oh, we're going to cut around our exit wound. So again, this bear was shot with a 270. There we go. And I'm going to want to trim around that wound. And I'm going to throw that into my throwing away pile. You don't want to feed that lead contaminated meat to your chickens or your dog. Um, or your family. Okay, so there's still even way more fat here, eh? You want it all off? Well, I think, um, yeah, because we don't want to cook it with that much fat on ever. So we're gonna <laughs> days, days of days of fat trimming. Yeah. I mean, I like I like fatty meat, but uh, this is a bit excessive. I gotta be careful here, I'm starting to cut into those tenderloins a little bit. Bear fat's also nice to mix with uh, other leaner meats, so if you're doing um, venison sausage or moose sausage and you're not opposed to using bear fat instead of pork fat, it's fantastic for that. You can you can render it and store it in um, jars indefinitely or uh, you can also just chunk it up and freeze it and then grind it when you grind your other meats. Or fat. Our whole table's fat now. <laughs> Heck we're what, 30% fat? <laughs> oh, more right now. More? 40? Maybe. By the time we're done? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of fat. Which, I mean, it's a shame a lot of people don't use the fat and, you know, you shoot a shoot a big bear and you end up, you know, if you throw away all this fat, you might be disappointed at what's left as far as meat goes. Well, and probably um, people don't realize that that fat actually tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, as a society, we're getting over our fat aversion slowly. But uh, you probably can't really get... A healthier fat than uh, bear fat. What I'll probably do just because of all the commitments I have in the next few days is uh, put this into a bunch of uh, heavy Ziploc bags and um, <laughs> good save. Well that was cool. That was a lot of fat. <laughs> uh, I'll just freeze it and then uh, I'll work on it. Work on it uh, later when I have time. We've, uh, we've done all this in the bush with no infrastructure, right? Yeah. During the Wilderness Living Challenge. And um, ate and preserved it too. Yeah. <laughs> but it is nice to have your hoisting system, proper work tables. Okay. <clears throat> so our two rear quarters, they come down and they kind of meet the spine. You can feel where they meet the spine right here. So I'm gonna make a cut there and to the spine and find that on the other side and cut through to the spine and then Chris is 
probably going to hold this by the rib cage and the neck mm -hmm. and I'm going to cut through with the saw. You can do that now? Yeah. Does it make you nervous that I'm cutting towards you? A little bit. And I'm actually holding it through the bullet hole. Okay. So this is just getting frozen and we'll work with it later. As should be fairly apparent from this video, you don't need a super fancy setup to do all this work at home. So don't be scared because you don't have your own private butcher shop or uh, specialized equipment. I think it'll fit just as it is, but... The key thing is just to set aside a lot of time um, so that you're not rushed and do your homework, watch some videos, check some books, um, offer to help somebody, uh, even if you don't get large game to work on, somebody you know might be happy to have your help and then you can learn from them. The neck. Um, some people say that the neck meat is tough and that you want to just take the time to bone it all out and then set that aside to grind. I actually find that the neck makes a very good roast. So what I'm going to do is make a cut around the neck uh, at the base of the torso and I'm going to cut it with the saw because I do find that um, cutting through the spine with a knife is, is really quite tricky. There's the and then I just put the whole neck in my slow cooker as a neck roast. So let's take off the neck. Just uh, make sure you discard this uh, okay. from the shot yep. wound. People uh, consider bears to be like really tough animals, really solid animals. I actually find them to have, um, like their bones are shorter and thicker than a deer, but their ribs are not very big. You know, when you're thinking of like bullet performance and stuff, I think the bigger impediment is like the extra inches of fat that they have all around them. So this, uh, we're going to trim this fat off the neck roast and this flap off the base of the neck roast. I also previously was careful to take out the uh, trachea, like the windpipe and the esophagus. So this is a nice clean inside. This is where you'll find some of those filarial worms. They tend to uh, be a little more numerous here. So again, don't let them scare you away from good meat. When you see them, you just pick them and discard them and remind yourself that they Although they are visible, they cannot harm you. Okay. Do you want to trim yep. that mm -hmm. fat cap and then I'll talk about ribs. Um, there's a couple different ways you can approach this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by removing the tenderloins from the back and then that's going to let me see my ribs a little more clearly we also want to remember to cut around our cavity if you're worried about forgetting that just do it right off the hop while you're thinking of it so i'm going to cut until i'm about two 
two ribs back and two ribs in front of that exit wound. And let's get one more. Slice down. And cut it along those guys at the bottom. And that just goes. It hurts to see that much meat go, but uh, you don't want to eat that lead. Okay, now this is the center of the spine here. I would say removing the tender lines, which run basically from your neck roast that you just cut off down to the hip where you cut it off. This is one of the trickier cuts to um, take it off and have it looking really nice. So I'm cutting along the spine until I bump it against the, uh, basically against the ribs. Okay, so I can feel my knife tip running along those bones. And then you want to follow the top of the ribs. while you take this off. Now, the pointier the tip of your knife is, and the slower you cut, the more meat you're gonna weasel out from in between the spine and the ribs, and the more meat you're gonna have then on this tenderloin. It's gonna come off as one beautiful meat log and you have to decide what you want to do with that beautiful meat log once you've got it off so let's just finish taking that out it's going to be quite quite marbled and fatty i think on a deer this would be a pretty lean cut eh chris uh, the, like you, the chops you might not use it <laughs> what is oh this yeah that that's your money yeah, yeah. but i was just For saying deer? on a on a bear it's pretty fatty oh yeah but on a deer it's, oh, it's a, a pretty lean yeah. cut quick cook quick cook yeah we don't really quick cook, cook bear because of the no. trichinosis but because of the dryness of the uh beer yeah yeah you don't no want fat it. to speak of unless you cook it with some bear fat maybe yeah, well yeah you don't want to eat beer fat no. Bear fat's pretty good though. Um, in fact, I would say that it is excellent. So, there we go. I didn't do a super particular job there, but I didn't want you to lose interest. So, there's our beautiful meat log. There's another beautiful meat log on the other side of the spine that we're going to take off. Um, but now that we've got our meat log, we decide do we cut it? into steaks or do we cut it into roasts that's i'm, I'm a steak guy yeah because I, I just want one couple pieces for each yeah. person yeah so i'm going to pass this to chris he's going to cut it into the size and thickness of steaks that he wants he may or may not get particular about trimming off some of this fat that we i'm not He's not particular. Keep it greasy. Keep it greasy. Yeah, well, greasy there's, steak. there's a pretty big slab here by my thumb. That one might. That might cut the one. Yeah. Okay, so Chris is going to work on that. Um, now that I've taken off this, it's much easier for me to see where my extra uh, grinding meat is. So I'm going to trim that off, put it in my fat and grind pile. Um, but it also lets me see where my ribs are along the spine and I'm going to take off a rack of ribs and um, up up near the chest here sneaky little red squirrel yeah. is it carrying it? oh it's carrying the squirrel nest that's yeah. bad news um, some of this I might take off and grind uh, or I might take off another rack of ribs off the front here 
Uh, I just have this line because that's where I took out the shot. And this is kind of ideal. This is how you want to shoot all your animals through the ribs, through the lungs, not hitting any of the main meat. So let's see, I'm just trimming my rib edges, throwing them in the grind pile, and then I'm basically following the edge of the spine. And most of these ribs are small enough that they're like a one push, a one push cut, unless I hit the spine, which is quite a bit thicker. There you go, you just cut yourself a rack of ribs. All right, look up some recipes. Don't, don't waste these beautiful ribs. Those are good. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side and because it's exactly the same, I'm not gonna show it twice. But just to remind you, I'm gonna remove this. Maybe this is the exit side here or the entrance. That's the entrance. I'm gonna remove the bullet entrance hole. I'm gonna take off the beautiful tenderloin. Once that's off, I see the line of my ribs. I'm gonna cut off um, a front rack of ribs and a back rack of ribs. Hind quarters. <clears throat> There's a couple of ways to approach these hind quarters. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll come in with my knife and I will remove that ham roast from the hip by finding the hip socket and working my way around it with the knife tip. That comes off as a roast and then I have my bare leg roast which is the lower portion of the leg. You also can cut um, round steaks off of this side of the back quarter and you can cut sirloin steaks out of the forward facing part of the rear quarter. You can do that while it's hanging. The other way to approach it, which I'll do today, is um, I'm just going to saw down the middle of the pelvis bone and then I'll have two free hanging quarters and it makes it easy to take a quarter off and then work on it individually and then take the other quarter off and work on it individually. Then I'll go back and take this round and sirloin off and I'll be left with a hip roast or what I call a hip roast. So let's cut through the middle of the pelvis and then through the spine and the tail. I'm going to take the back leg off, the back foot off, pardon me, starting a cut with my knife and sawing through there, that gets discarded. Now we're going to decide about how we want to approach this back quarter. Again, we're going to have fat to trim in all likelihood, depending on your preferences. And I'm going to take this um, back leg off for the leg roast so i'm bending the leg to see where the joint is i'm going to cut the cartilage around that joint i'm going to let gravity do some of the work for me here oh, yeah i ended up on the 
wrong side of it. That's a bear leg roast. Okay, so I've got the hip uh, on the far end of the camera here and the leg on the near end of the camera. You can usually see the line, if you don't have too much fat, you can see the line of the sirloin roast. It's a name? Bear leg roast. And the sirloin roast you can remove by making a cut at that leg joint and then um, basically cutting right where that muscle seam is. So you see I'm just following the silver skin until I get to the bone and then I'm going to remove it along the bone. Just following this whole muscle group, cutting it off at the bone, flip it over to look at this other side, and now we have probably the leanest cut on the bear once you take the fat on the outside is this um, sirloin roast. Again, you can cut it into steaks. I do quite like this one as its own roast. Just pull out those worms as you find them. Don't be shy about it. We don't say ew. We say interesting. Now because I took the sirloin off, I've got bone on one side and then meat wrapping all the way around the other side. That's the round roast. And I've also made it a lot easier by taking the sirloin off to see the joint of the uh, leg bone coming into the hip. So what I'm going to do is cut around that. You can see the pelvic bone here, the tailbone at the top. I'm going to follow the bottom side of the pelvic bone to take my round roast all the way to the joint. Where's my joint? Dude, where's my joint? Just twist it again. Is it my? It's right up in there. This is probably the joint with the most cartilage around it. Um, it is like a major major muscle groups attaching here that's for sure. Um, a lot of this is knife tip work. This is a like again it's a, a ball and socket joint like the one that connects the front shoulder to the blade. And just gonna cut through a little bit more of this. I'm getting muscle cramps because I haven't stayed hydrated. Mm, you want to twist it? You can probably um, twist it out. Yep. Yeah. Oh no, I gotta cut it a bit. So I neat, saw neat, it's neat. still connected on the back side here.
You hear that? Mm -hmm. That was part of it letting go. And then once you get around that ball, you just cut the connecting tissue and that's that. So this, this ends up being quite a large roast of bear. This is good if you've got a big group or if you like to cook something that you eat for like six days after, um, which I, I certainly don't mind to do. Uh, but again, you can package it as a round roast or you can cut it into steaks or you can, uh, all these, all these big muscles too, uh, we haven't talked about this, but you can cut them into stew chunks um, or you can grind it all and just uh, take the easy way out. Grinding meat is super easy and it's also you end up with a very versatile product. We're going to leave that as a round roast and then <clears throat> with this hip, this is kind of a wonky looking thing because it's got the pelvic bone, a bit of the spine and tail, it's got back fat, it's got some meat skirts on it. You can package this up and call it a hip roast um, or you can trim it all off and turn it into whatever you want. Grinding meat, stew meat, um, or whatever. I, I often find that roasts are uh, the least amount of work. Least amount of cutting, um, kind of the easiest thing to uh, slow cook. If you uh, are someone who puts a meal on in the morning and then eats it at night, which is what I often do. So I'm tempted to just leave this as a hip roast. And you can always make it smaller. Yeah, you can always thaw it and cut pieces off later, for sure. Where am I here? <clears throat> so, butcher your own animals. Uh, you'll find it immensely rewarding, even if you screw it up. Uh, trust me, I've screwed up a bunch of animals before, but that's how I've learned. Uh, when was the last time you took an animal to a butcher? <laughs> never? Ne never. Never. I've never done it. Once. I was in a hunting... Oh, I brought a bear, a better bear once, and I paid $100 for it, and I, it felt terrible oh. spending that much money to yeah. do it. And this was but like... But he made sausage and everything. This, this was, was like, like 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, these are really rewarding things to do and, and they're definitely worth carving out the time to do them, I think anyway. Obviously, you are considering it if you're watching this video. Um, so give it a whirl. Uh, I'm not the best video out there, so, so do, do your homework. But uh, definitely um, smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications and all those things. But I will see you on the next one, YouTube.